very weird today because when I logged in, the audio settings weren't what they normally are. So, <clears throat> okay. All right, uh, let's get started. Um, so I didn't check to see whether or not uh, 5.7 had been graded yet, um, but it should be graded you know, relatively soon. 6.1 is due today, but I've assigned homework 6.2. It's due Monday. It's not due Friday, okay? Um, normally we would have an assignment due Friday, but this assignment is going to be a little longer than normal. Um, and there's no real way around that given the topic, so I want to give you more time to do it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to um, go through a problem today, and then on Friday I'm going to talk about some tips and tricks to make this process easier. Not just for the homework, but for virtual work for beams uh, in general. Um, but before we jump into the lecture today, I wanted to take a little bit of a second and talk about logistics moving forward for the next little bit, okay? So today, um, we're talking about deflection problems with multiple moment functions. Last time we talked about deflection problems with single moment functions. Um, I'm gonna assign a homework on that today, but it's due Monday because on Friday we're talking about virtual work strategies to make the process a little easier. Now Monday we're talking about frame deflections and really the, um, the uh, I guess, point of that lecture is what if you considered stuff besides flexural deformations? What if you considered axial deformations? And then I'll have a note on what happens if you consider shear deformations. When should you consider it and how it affects the answer at the end of the day? That'll be our discussion for Monday. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about the homeworks coming up because this is a little weird. Um, so I kind of want to explain. So this day the, for the exam review, there are two assignments due, but there aren't really two assignments. One of them is an actual you know, frame deflection problem. The other is I want you to install MassCam and upload proof that you've done it. So that's what homework 6.3 and 6.4 are. They're both due the same day, but they're not really, the other one's not really a homework assignment. You just have to install a program. Uh, if you have, pro so one thing I'll say with that homework assignment is I want it done by Wednesday, but if you encounter installation issues, like let me know, I'm not gonna count that late against you. But the point is, after the exam, I want it on everybody's computer so that we can come in and get ready to use it. So that's, that's why I'm sort of forcing you to do it. Okay, speaking of, we have an exam review next Wednesday and next Friday we celebrate. Uh, so Friday, October 28th, we're gonna have our second exam. Okay, now what's gonna happen after the exam is I'm, we're gonna spend two days in class going through MassDAN. MassDAN is the software package that we use to analyze structures, uh, uh, that we're gonna use to analyze structures. And so I'm gonna give you a homework assignment on that. That's homework seven, it's gonna be due Friday. So we'll have two days of in-class lecture on MassDAN and then you'll have a MassDAN assignment due Friday. Then we get into influence lines and we're kinda of back to business as usual. Okay, does that make sense? So we got a, a weird couple days coming up on um, assignments and I wanted to make sure that everybody was kind of clear on what was due and when it was due. If anybody needs to take a picture of this, you can. Yep. <laughs> Wait, go back. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that again, so. <laughs> That's for your benefit, just as, as, as yeah, for mine. What's that? Your album. My, <laughs> I saw that, I said, you all have way too much time on your hands, so. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> well, they're skewed, I would say. Okay. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Okay. So hopefully now everybody has kind of an idea of what's going on on the um, uh, assignment structure over the next couple lectures. Let's get into it. All right. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at deflection problems involving multiple moment functions. So last time. You know, we were employing the, uh, the method of virtual work for computing deflections, and we were integrating little m times big M over EI um, for our problems, and then multiplying by the appropriate unit conversion factor. We're not doing anything differently here, only instead of doing one integral, we're gonna be doing a few of them, and we're gonna have to sum the results of those integrals up. So 
it's just a little bit more calculus. It's not harder, um, but there is something to be said about your bookkeeping, and you have to be cognizant of what functions you integrate where. Um, and I actually am going to have a little bit of a discussion about um, what happens if you have a variable cross section and how that changes the problem. Doesn't make it harder, but it does lead to more calculus. Fortunately, if you have a Casio or a TI 36, it'll do a lot of the integration for you, but you do have to set it up. Once you set it up, the integrals are, are pretty plug and chug. Now, like I said, uh, in our last example, we only needed one big M function and one little M function. Uh, in many pro K problems, that's not going to happen. And so, what we'll have to do, just like we did last time, is we'll have to assess how many piecewise functions we'll need to define not just the real moments, but the virtual moments uh, as well. Um, and we'll have to just uh, take care of cognizant bookkeeping uh, when we perform our integration. And the best way of explaining that is to just nosedive into an example. Okay? So I have a beam here uh, that uh, has a uniformly distributed load on it. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute the deflection. We probably aren't going to get to the rotation today, I'm just going to tell you. But we're at least going to try and do the deflection uh, at point B using the method of virtual work. Um, and here's our beam. Uh, and we're going to see that we've got multiple integrals that we need to evaluate. Okay. Now, I've already thrown a coordinate system on there for you. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this note here at the end. Um, I don't want to really want to talk about it now because I don't want to introduce even more confusion before we get into this. But we'll, um, we'll talk about that near the end. So let's just sort of uh, nosedive right into this. Now, a couple things that we'll just make sure that we're clear about right now. We know that, whoop, we know that E is 4,000 KSI, and we know that I is 6,000 inches to the fourth. And ultimately, what we're going to have to do for this problem, whether it's deflection or rotation, is now our formula is a little bit more involved. Instead of just integrating mm over ei, we now have to sum up those integrals um, dependent upon how many of them that we need. Okay? So, so this is basically sort of our, our fundamental approach here. Now, what we're going to need to do is um, develop not only real functions, but virtual functions as well. All right, so we're going to start off with the real structure because I think that's the easiest. Um, and then we'll get into our virtual structure um, uh, moment functions. And I'm going to try and make it a little easier on you in developing those, uh, those, those functions. So, okay. <clears throat> so let's start off with the real structure. Okay, so we'll make sure that everybody's awake this morning because I want to ask some questions about this. So the real structure is 30 foot long and it is subjected to a uniformly distributed load of 1.2 kips per foot. Now we have a coordinate system. This is x. This is y. So our origin is right over here at point A. So we'll call this point A and we'll call this point C. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, I guess it's not technically necessary but I'm going to do it because I want to make sure that whatever we derive comports with what we would get if we were to draw this graphically. Um, so I'm going to graphically construct the shear and moment diagrams. I want to see what they look like. Now, um, first off, in order to do that, I need to compute the reactions. Okay. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a shortcut in doing this because this problem is really simple. Okay. I have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load across the entire span. So if that's the case, without doing any math, what can you tell me about these two reactions? They're equal. Exactly. They're going to be the same. And so basically what I can do is I can say by symmetry, hold on, let me, 
a little better than that. I can say that the reactions are going to be 1.2 kips per foot times 30 feet. That's the entire load on the beam divided by 2. And when you check that out, what is that? Let's see. 1.2 times 30, that's 36. 36 over 2 is 18. So 18 kips. So that means this is 18 kips. That means that this is 18 kips. <coughs> so no need to sum forces or sum moments. Just be simple with it. And I, I want to say this. I'm going to start doing stuff like that for probably for the rest of the semester. I've been pretty formal with, okay, we need sum forces and sum moments. But come on, we're engineers. I mean, you should be able to look at that and just see, look, they're going to be equal. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of instances in the land of engineering where we try and exploit symmetry as much as possible. So let's try and keep things simple when we can. Okay. Now, let's take a look at this. So, so now let, let's, let's start constructing diagrams. So what do we got? We've got... All right. So we start off with our shear diagram, okay? And so how do we do that? So we start off at zero. What's the first thing that I do? Up 18. And what does the shear diagram look like from A to C? Excuse me. Downward linear, right? With a slope of negative 1.2. So if I'm at 18, what am I going to end at over here? Negative 18, right? Because I'm dropping down a total amount of 36 to negative 18. And then that reaction brings me up to zero. So we have a really nice shear diagram from a geometry perspective. What's this distance right here? 15, it's, it's half, the, tri or half the, the span. So this dimension here is 15 feet. So if that's 15 feet, what is the area of this triangle? So one half 18 times 15, so nine times 15, so that's 135. So this is gonna be plus 135, this is going to be minus 135. So our moment diagram, so we go like this. We start at zero. We go lot to a little, up to 135, little to a lot, back down to zero. That's our moment diagram. <clears throat> now, I, I'll admit my, my artwork there is not really um, conducive to the answer to the question I'm about to ask. But how many moment functions is going to be necessary to fully define this moment diagram? Remember, we sort of we say, OK, let's um, you know, sort of cut a section and move it. How many are going to be needed? What's that? One. One, right? This is actually all the same parabola. I know it kind of looks like it's disjointed there, but this is all the same parabola that just has an apex or, or a, a pinnacle of 135 at mid-span. Okay, so that's the maximum moment. So when I derive my moment expression, I should get a parabola that opens downward and I should also be able to plug in x equals 15 and get a value of 135. So there is some value in doing this, even though it's not technically necessary to get the function. Um, at least we'll be able to have some gut check that our moment function looks the way that it should. Okay. Now to derive that function, what I'm going to do, so I'm going to cut a section. So we'll say section 1, 1 looking left 
And I'm going to put a little note over here off to the side, and I'm going to say note it's usually advantageous to look towards the origin. More on this later. So I'm actually going to discuss and show you why that's the case on Friday. But whenever you're cutting a section, always look towards the origin. The origin's right here. Here's my coordinate system. The origin's there. Look towards the origin. Trust me on that, and I'll kind of show you why next time. So, so draw our positive shear and our positive moment. This is 1.2 kips per foot. This is 18 kips. This dimension here is X, right? That's X right here, okay? And so I can collapse that into a distributed load. What's the magnitude of that load? 1.2x. And then that dimension right here is x over 2. So summing moments at the cut. You know, this problem ought to look a little familiar, right? It's almost like that homework 5.4 y'all did, right? It's, it's like I do this stuff on purpose or something. Okay, so we have 18 times x. one point two x times x over 2 and m. 18x equals m plus, what is that, 0 0.6x squared. So therefore, m is 18x minus 0.6x squared. So what do we have? We have a parabola opening downwards because the uh, quadratic term is negative. And then what happens if we plug in 15? What is 18 times 15 minus 0.6 times 15 squared? I'm curious. One thirty-five, which is exactly what we got here. So there was some benefit in doing this. I, I think there was. Okay. Now, I am also going to put my range of applicability there because that is really going to be important here in a bit. So for the real structure, we only needed one moment function to fully define the diagram. But for the virtual structure, that's not going to be the case. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give everybody a sec to catch up, and then we're going to go to the virtual structure and see what happens there. Oh, there's a fire truck over there. Everything's okay. <clears throat> All right. So far, so good. Okay. Now let's go back to the beginning of the problem. The problem states that we are to find uh, the deflection at B. Okay. So now let's look at the virtual structure. So this is for vertical displacement at B, okay? 
So the way that's going to work is I'm going to have the beam. So here's the beam. All right. Let's put our coordinate system on here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick all those original loads off the structure and I'm going to place a single load right here at B. You tell me, do I place this load upwards or downwards? Down. I think that the original structure is going to deflect downwards. So I'm going to put that load going down. Now again, there's no technically wrong answer. I mean, if you placed it up, you would just get a negative deflection, which means your assumption is wrong. But you know, let's try and make our lives a little easier here. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to have some dimensions here. So this was 10 feet. This is 20 feet. And we're going to have reaction. Now we're going to have to solve for some reactions. So I'm going to call this um, A, Y. We'll call this C, Y because this is point A, B, and C. So now let's treat this like we would any other problem, right? So what do we do? We sum moments, let's say, at A. So what happens if we sum moments at A? We get 1 times 10 equals CY times 30. So we get 10 feet equals CY times 30 feet. So that equals one third. And if that equals one third, what's that going to be? Two thirds. Two thirds. That two looks strange. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. We're going to draw our shear and moment diagram. So So we'll just use the letter V, little v. So we start at zero, and now the first thing that we do is we jump up to two-thirds, right? We jump up to two-thirds, no change, then we drop down to minus one-third over go back up to zero. Huh. We do some integration, right? So two thirds times 10 is 20 thirds. This is minus 20 thirds, right? So that works out. We have our balance of areas. But now the moment diagram is not parabolic. Now the moment diagram is linear. So we start at zero, jump up to 20 over 3, and then back down to zero. Now, 
I want to make sure everybody's caught up with me because before you start cutting sections, we're going to be engineers about this. We're going to make our lives a little easier. And I'm all about making our lives easier. Okay. All right. Everybody with me so far? Now, how many moment functions are necessary to fully define this moment diagram? Two. Okay. But can you tell me about what these functions are going to look like? The last one was a parabola. These are lines, right? They're linear. Okay. So what do you need to define a line? You need a slope and you need an intercept, right? Okay. What is the slope of that line? Two thirds. What's the slope of that line? Negative one third. Let's do a little bit of basic algebra here, okay? Let's call this first one M1. <clears throat> so we'll call this function M1. We'll call this function M2. Okay. So the slope of this line is two thirds. Okay. And remember, right? Here's the y axis, here's the x axis, right? Here's the y axis, here's the x axis. So if I want to draw this line, what is a point that this line goes through? Zero, zero, right? So we'll say point is zero, zero. Therefore, the y-intercept is zero. There's your function. Y equals mx plus b. B is zero. Now what's the range for this? What's the range of applicability? It's not zero to 30, it's zero to 10. Now you're starting to see why those ranges are important, right? Because now this function is only valid, ah, only valid for a given range. With me so far? Okay, what about this equation over here? Okay, the slope is negative one-third. What about a point that this line occupies? I'm lazy, so I think there's two points that we could use, this one or that one. What are the coordinates of that point? 30, 0. I like dealing with zeros because a lot of stuff cancels out. So a point that this function occupies is 30, 0. So What do you think? Isn't that going back to basic algebra? <clears throat> I did it in a different color because I didn't want you to confuse like this m with that. That's the slope. This is the moment function. So, but I'm just using point slope formula. Y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Pretty basic uh, uh, math 127 stuff. Oh. Ah. So 
So what do you think? So far so good? Okay. So now, uh, let me give you all a sec to catch up and then we'll, we'll get into our integration. How are we doing on time? Beautiful, we're doing just fine. Because distributing negative one third times negative 30 plus a 10. That's a good question though. No, that's fine. That algebra, man, it gets you. I mean, I'm telling you, in this class, and, and what I found was, uh, so I have a theory, I think algebra is harder than calculus. I'm sorry, I do. I think that the calculus is rote and easy to remember, but it's always this stuff. So. <clears throat> and students that struggle with calculus, I don't think they struggle with calculus, I think they struggle with the algebra on top of it. So. I'm getting off the soapbox. Okay. All right. Let's apply the method of virtual work. And let's just recap some things to make sure that we're all cognizant of what we're doing. So M, big M, is 18x minus 0.6x squared. And that's valid from 0 to 30. And then we have M1, which is 2 thirds X, and that's valid from 0 to 10. And then M2, which is negative 1 third X plus 10, which is valid from 10 to 30. Okay, now let's not forget that E is 4,000 and I is 6,000. Okay. All right. So here's what we've got. Okay. So we're trying to find the deflection at B. Okay. The deflection at B is found by summing the integrals of little m, big M over EI dx. That's that's our method. Okay. So what we got to do is, is, is I think this next step is probably the most critical. Everything past this is just kind of rote and, and plug and chuck. Okay. So now our big M function is valid across the whole span. But the little M function is only valid, you know, there's two of them. One's valid from 0 to 10, one's valid from 10 to 30. So that means we have two integrals that we need to evaluate, okay? So we've got the first integral from 0 to 10, which is going to be m1 m over ei dx. And then another integral, which is 10 to 30, but now we have a new function. And don't forget, we have our unit conversion factor that we need to account for at the very end. Now what I'm going to do next is recognize a couple things. E and I are both constants, right? E is 4,000, I is 6,000 and they're in the same integral, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that out and I'm going to have 1728 over EI. Okay, <clears throat> and now what we've got is 2 thirds X dx and then
then I've got that. And so these are my two calculus problems. But again, if I want, I can just do that in here. This will do it for me. That, that's, that's not, and these integrals are really not, not all that challenging. Um, the one thing you got to do with this one, if you wanted to do it by hand, is foil. You got to do first times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, last times last, and you get, you know, uh, uh, an integral that you need to evaluate. It's not hard, it just takes you a while, okay? So, we'll call this an integral and call this an integral. I'll call it I1 and I2, if, if that helps. You tell me, are you okay if I give you the answer or do you want to go through it for the integrals? I'm happy to. You want to go through the integration or you want me to just give you the answer? I'll go ahead and give you the answer. This integral, when you evaluate it, ends up being 3,000. Okay? And this next one ends up being 8,000. So therefore, we get 1728 over EI times 3,000 plus 8,000. So now it gets really easy. And so, I'll go ahead and help you out with this one. When you plug and chug, you get positive 0 Given our time frame, what I will probably do is after, like I'm, I got something else I want to show you, but after this, what I will probably do is show you the um, how you do the rotation, and you have similar split integrals. Um, I'll probably not evaluate the calculus unless you want me to. Maybe I'll do that at the very end just to show you here's the calculus. So, but I mean it's it's pretty basic integration. So. Let me stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions. I hope that you don't find this like terribly difficult. I mean, the hard part I think is deriving the functions, but in the end, if you're just applying statics, it's not that challenging. The best thing to make sure is that when you're integrating this, make sure you apply your parentheses appropriately. So. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. It's it's an yeah. It's an in inches. That's what our seventeen twenty eight will do is get that into inches. And normally we want to express deflections in inches, anyways. Yeah. That's what I thought when I was looking back at my notes yesterday. Yeah. No. All uh, all our deflection problems will will want inches across the board. <coughs> Sound good? Okay. I want to take a. Um, a second and show you something that happens practically and what you have to do. Um, I want to talk about uh, variable cross sections. So, <clears throat> so I want to make a note on a variable cross section problem. So I want to talk about this problem. Okay, this is uh, so. First off, what we're looking at when I say variable cross section, I mean beams that change depth or change their cross-section along the span. Now to be clear, we do this in the real world all the time, particularly in the land of bridges. 
So for example, if you look at this from a moment diagram perspective, the largest bending moments are in the middle of the beam, not at the end. So you don't need the depth uh, at the um, ends, you really only need it in the middle, right? And so what an engineer will do is they'll say, I'll tell you what, let's only use a deeper section in the middle of the beam where we really need it, okay? Now, that adds fabrication costs, and I could talk about this all day long in the land of steel design, but there are rules for, you know, if you're going to save so much weight on your girder, go ahead and do it. And, and it actually ends up being economical at the end of the day. It's just a function of material costs versus labor costs. And whenever the one outweighs the other, go ahead and do it. Okay. So, so in the end, there is a, a practical reason for doing this. If you are ever looking at a, um, uh, a highway bridge, particularly a plate girder bridge, so we're talking about somewhat relatively long uh, steel beam bridges we're talking about in the 150 200 foot range take a look at them whenever you get a chance take a look at the flanges and you'll more often than not see that the flanges get thicker in the middle like that 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 tends to happen usually around like if we're talking about a simply supported bridge it tends to happen a lot like about for the middle 60 percent of the span uses a thicker flange and the end 20 percent uh, uh spans use a smaller flange so this is, this is not that unheard of from a, a, a real world perspective. But from an analysis standpoint, this creates problems, okay? The first problem is that we have piecewise functions for both the real structure and the virtual structure, okay? So if I use my coordinate system right here, the real moment diagram, so what's the shear diagram look like? We go up, over, down, over, up. So the moment diagram is going to go linear and linear. So there's going to be two linear functions for the real structure and likewise two linear uh, uh, functions for the virtual structure. So we have uh, these two functions here. Now fortunately they all get defined at the same place, but what gets funky is, that, uh, is what happens with this cross section. See the moment functions, they don't care about what happens here. But because the EI is inside the integral, ultimately we have to do this, okay? We have to integrate, you know, you know, M1 and M1 from 0 to 10, then M1 and M1 from 10 to 22, then M2 and M2 from 22 to 34, and then again from 34 to 44. So we have four integrals that we need to evaluate. That's a pain, isn't it? So maybe there's a better way of doing it, okay? The answer is yes, there is a better way of doing it. The trick is to exploit symmetry. So one of the things that you can do is you can actually only consider these first two. So instead of integrating all four of them, only integrate these two and then double your answer. But we're gonna, those tips and tricks are gonna be the entire focus of the lecture on Friday, so. <laughs> what do you think? Any questions on that? So I would I would actually be interested. How many of you are going on Friday to Nitro? Everybody going? Yeah. Can't. You missed it. That that bridge doesn't have. Um, see, this would be a discrete jump in depth, whereas that bridge has a continuous jump in depth. Like if you look at the girders, the girders go like this, like they gradually get deeper. So it's called a haunch section. And they do that because at the pier, at the support location, the moments are really high. So you make the girder deeper where it needs to be, right? But then that makes this, this problem even more complicated because instead of having an I value, you now have an I function. You have I as a function of that. So instead of just, mm over ei i being a constant it's mm over ei i being a variable so now there's you have to account for that too so but that's what makes it fun anybody is anybody going I entered there. I don't know that. <laughs> so you've seen it i've seen it okay yeah. all I right the, um, when they listed the girders for the last or the bridge I was okay. see i mean if you get it, like, if you have just the slightest inkling to go, to go, I mean, come on, it's a bridge. Bridges are awesome. I like bridges. Are you going to be there? I, I'm, I'm going to try and go, yes. I 
I understand. I understand. All right. Any questions? Okay. Friday's lecture is all about tips and tricks to make all this math easier. Um, but you have a homework due Monday. I would take a look at it and make. So one thing I will say, to ease your workload, I would probably try and construct your graphical shear and moment diagrams before you start deriving functions. It'll make your life a little easier. Um, what we talk about on Friday will give you some tips and tricks to make the math quicker for you as you solve these problems. That's all I got. I will see you all on Friday.